So we had two questions that came through on the Q&A and I thought we'd address them simultaneously. I accidentally threw them away. So give me just a second here. <clears throat> so the first question is, is it possible that a narrow ISA can become a wide ISA after prolonged periods of compressive training, such as powerlifting? And would you treat them as a narrow or wide? So I think this is a really good question because there's a lot of confusion as to how some of these ISAs can actually appear when you try to measure them. The second question, obviously this person read the first question and says, I'll second this question, but phrased differently, can a narrow ISA present as a wide ISA measure and would total shape of the rib cage be a sign of this? And so because there is an element of confusion as to how some of these infrasternal angles can appear, let's talk about how a narrow infrasternal angle may actually look like a wide, but they're not really a wide. So I've drawn two rib cages with, with narrow infrasternal angles. They're obviously perfectly to scale. Um, so we'll have a great representation here. But what I wanted to talk about is, is how the rib cage can actually change shape based on training. And there's a lot of confusion as to what constitutes the wide or the narrow infrasternal angle. So because these are two people that are going to start with narrow infrasternal angles, the reason that they have a narrow infrasternal angle to begin with is because of their physical structure. So they're genetically predetermined to have a narrow infrasternal angle based on the helical structure of the axial skeleton. So we're using the, the infrasternal angle as a representation of their helical structure. So the helical structure are actually the, the angles at which the ribs are positioned, the musculature is oriented, and so that's a predetermined genetic trait which would bias you towards one structure or the other. So in other words, um, you're not going to make somebody taller, you're not going to make their hands any bigger, and you're not going to make their feet any bigger because genetically they're predetermined to have certain structure. The infrasternal angle is just one of those things that is going to be predetermined. Now, the question is, can it be manipulated through training? Yes and no. So think about how training superimposes compressive strategies on top of the body. Whether you're wide or whether you're narrow, training increases the amount of concentric orientation of musculature because typically with training, we're trying to increase our ability to produce force. So lift heavy things, run really fast, jump really high, throw really far. So if I superimpose concentric activity on top of a rib cage, and especially when we're talking about narrow ISAs, one of the things that actually closes the infrasternal angle is the external oblique, which is oriented as such. So once again, I have a genetically predetermined orientation of how this musculature will be laid down across the axial skeleton, just like the orientation of the ribs themselves. So now let's talk about training that will ultimately increase concentric orientation, exhalation strategy, internal pressure, all designed to maximize our force output, increase our speed, increase our, our ability to jump or throw or whatever it may be. The musculature that's going to help us produce those forces is the most superficial of musculature. So now think about the big muscles that everybody tries to develop. So these would be pecs, lats, trapezius. One of the more superficial muscles that gets forgotten is rectus abdominis. So rectus abdominis attaches above the apex of the infrasternal angle and is oriented basically as such. Because it crosses the infrasternal angle, if I increase my compressive superficial muscular strategies, I will create an anterior compression against the infrasternal angle. Now, one of the things you have to understand about a narrow infrasternal angle is that it's also represented by straighter ribs. If I increase the compressive strategy associated with rectus abdominis, what will happen is they will start to bend the ribs backwards as a byproduct of this concentric strategy. Because these ribs start to bend, 
it may make the infrasternal angle appear to be wider than it actually is. This obviously creates some confusion as to what constitutes a wide or a narrow infrasternal angle. Another thing to keep in mind is that while we talk about the extremes of narrows and wides, most people fall somewhere between this broad spectrum of being either a combination of both or closer to one end of the, of the spectrum than the other. So if someone is biased towards the middle of this broad spectrum that could fall into the wide or narrow case and I get this compressive strategy, it's merely going to make the infrasternal angle look wide. So the bottom line here is that you're not going to alter someone's genetically predetermined helical angles. You can manipulate it to some degree to increase force production, which is valuable from an athletic perspective. But if we're trying to restore movement capabilities, the production of compensatory exhalation strategies to increase force production still have to be considered in the appropriate sequence associated with their genetically predetermined helical angles as represented by the infrasternal angle. So the best course of action when you're on the fence as to whether someone's a wide ISA or a narrow ISA is to simply intervene. So you test, you intervene, and then you retest. If you were successful, then you simply follow the rule to amplify the good. If you're unsuccessful, consider a remeasurement, reconsider your intervention, and try again using the opposing strategy. Contrary to popular belief, trial and error is a scientific method. I hope that sheds a little bit of light on this subject because I know it can get confusing. So if you still have questions, keep them coming.